the host for the 2014 Commonwealth Games will be Glasgow. Seven years ago, Glasgow won the bid to host the 20th Commonwealth Games. This summer, athletes from 70 countries and millions of visitors will pour into the city. And Glasgow's run down East End will get a multi-million pound makeover. But where sporting dreams are made, communities can get destroyed. We are on the way. There's a massive development coming here. There's a machine coming here. It's called the Commonwealth Games. Of course we're on the way. For the last four years, we've followed the people of Dumarnock and Glasgow's East End, the epicentre of the Games this summer. With the Games comes big opportunities. We when they want 500 fucking million spent on a bull state. New jobs. How can human beings build something like this? It's unbelievable, man. It's just great, man, how, how it can be done. And a new East End. When will I get one of the horses? But what happens to a community when Scotland's largest ever sporting event comes to town? This and this day and age, so <laughs> assholes can run about in shorts for two weeks <laughs> and then say they're going to leave us a legacy. <laughs> Glasgow 2010. Four miles from the city centre lies Dilmarnock in the East End. One of the UK's biggest regeneration projects has just got underway. Four years to the Games and a velodrome and sports arena, as well as a village for 6,500 athletes, has to be built from scratch. And all of it here in Dilmarnock. Ready? I'm ready. I think the calm of games is the best thing to happen to this committee. <laughs> yeah, fucking bad. Open it up from a decrepit shithole to a nice area. <laughs> <laughs> Once thriving, Domanot used to have over 10,000 residents. Now there's less than 2,500. It's one of the UK's most deprived areas with a life expectancy 10 years less than the British average. But with the games, all this might change. This is the mama. This is you right in the middle of the homeland here. At 30 years old, Darren Folds is a father of five. A Dumanic lad born and bred, millions of pounds are being spent in his backyard. Oh, you're going to love it up here, Steve, I'll tell you. <laughs> the full Commonwealth Games, the velodrome, the car parking, the cycling tracks, everything you could possibly think of, right in front of your very eyes. <laughs> I seen all this land getting clear. I never realised it was so big. It was nothing but trees and dirt and tiles, but what a difference, I'll tell you. Can you come around here, Steve? The man looks my homeland. My father's, 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 father's always been for here. And I always stay in pride in it. He, he know that the man that was my homeland. I'm gonna show you shorts. Darren is the local entrepreneur. He and wife Amanda own an off license, a pound shop, and a cafe. My little empire. I'm gonna take you into I'll give you a tour of the shops. So this is my, my little off-sale, Steve. Hey, Linda, how are you? The shops are soon to be flattened to make way for the Commonwealth Games. But he sees this as a golden opportunity. This is prime land we're on at the moment. And it's only going to get welfare. See, right up until three, four years ago, he says to some of the man up, <laughs> you know, anywhere in Glasgow, they go, who? The man that we then stayed down there kind of thing. And then, but see, all of a sudden, when the games was announced that they were coming to the man up, oh, the man up, I'm V the man up. Or the dafty couldn't even spell the man up.
Just around the corner lives Margaret Giaconelli. A grandmother of three, she's a front row seat of the new development. Look, it's fantastic. My man kept saying, oh, it's huge, but you don't imagine it till you see everything all derelict and all, you know, the land all just cleared. There's going to be some once it's finished. It's new beginnings, isn't it, when you see it all like that? Sort of whoever's going to be here. You see, when you think all oh, the houses that was all here at one time, and then it's just all land. Margaret's tenement block once housed over 50 families. Now hers is the only one left. My neighbour moved out seven years ago. She was my neighbour for 30 odd years. Uh, she moved into one of the new houses. All the council tenants were moved, but Margaret and husband Jack, who owned their flat, remained. That's me putting the light on. I call it a wee compound, because that's what it's like now. They've just left everything. Windies is opened and everything. No, really, I try to keep in here clean and tidy. Her youngest son, Aaron, still lives at home. I call it my rogues gallery. All my photos. I've got four boys. A lot of them's been brought up in this house, and that's my wee granddaughter who loves it here. She comes to me every week. My wee father-in-law, he passed away. My mum and my dad, and my other wee grandson, Aidan, his name is. They mean everything to me, my grandkids and my boys. We're, we're family-orientated. But seven years of living in a condemned street has taken its toll. That's me there. I've lost 12 stone. With what's happened, people People actually walk by me, they don't realise it's me. The City Council have tried to get Margaret out for years, offering her £29,000 or part ownership of a house a few miles away. But Margaret wants to stay mortgage free and in the area she grew up in. This wee thing was older Mary. This belonged to my mammy. She has now been served a compulsory purchase order for £30,000, giving the council the right to take her home. Where I'm sitting is where the Commonwealth Village is, and as far as I'm led to believe, my building's got to be down for next year. Seven hundred new houses will be built between Margaret's house and the Clyde, and a further 765 after the games. Be Local councillor George Redmond remembers how the River Clyde was used to sell Glasgow to the Commonwealth Games Federation. The delegates come in there. They walk down this path. It's springtime and summer. The trees are, are, are green. You know, the, there's, the animals are all about the place. You know, the ducks and the swans are swimming. There's people on their bikes. There's joggers. Uh, you know, there's the, the roars come, come right down here as well. So, so they're seeing all of that and, and they're, they're selling a, a vision about how Dumalit would look uh, once it was, it was regenerated and once they had the, the houses right on the Clyde itself. George has been rooting for Dumalit since being elected in 1999. It's, it's what you've known, what you've grown up with. Been born in, in, into the area, you know. You've been raised in the area. My family have a, a history there. I have so many relatives and, and friends, you know, within that area. And, and you really want to, to 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 do well for them. You want to do well for, for that neighbourhood. They needed a wee bit of inspiration, and they needed, you know, just somebody to come up with a way forward for them. Hopefully, through the games, you know, we're putting Dumalin back on the map. But back on the map where. People are proud to, to say, come and visit me, you know, and don't want them. Come and see the, the new facilities that are there. You drop that stuff in for me. One of the main attractions will be the velodrome and sports arena costing £113 million. 
and with 70% of those who can work round here unemployed, it's a chance for some local boys to learn a trade on one of the game's biggest construction projects. Once I found out about the Commonwealth Games, I really wanted to get on a job on site, do something really a part of it. 18-year-old Stephen is from nearby Deniston. At first, I was a bit nervous coming on here because when I was at school, I was a class clown. I hardly had any standard grades. In here, I feel as if I can gain a lot more achievements and plus do something in life what I want to do. Just weeks into his new job, and Stephen is already getting a reputation. So, Stephen, why do they call you Golden and Straw? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a fucking suit. So, you're going to go and ride it. Sick nut. So, I'm going to become an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> fucking old. Hold on, you're going to sit. Take out your pocket and take it out of this roadshow. Mad, eh? Workmate Liam also grew up here, but he's unsure about what he's seeing. All my childhood memories are here. And basically the world has been flattened and something's got to get built on top of it. Does this going to make it better? Or is it going to make it worse? Time will tell, but minute. Today, Glasgow's East End has a mixed reputation, and Dilmarnock's no different. But it was once a thriving community. And I remember all the wains and all the dogs, and all the gangs all running up and down the streets. It was, it was something else, what it was. <laughs> all the good old days, as you say. <laughs> Been and gone. And when Councillor Redmond was growing up, there was little unemployment. 60s, early 70s. A fantastic place and you know just that whole bedlam of people I mean, this whole street here um, was tenements at, at one point my family um, you know my, my uncle and my grandfather uh, had shops a grocer's shop uh, a furniture shop you know so there was a bit of prosperity uh, you know in, in those days and a fantastic place to to live full employment lots of opportunities Many who lived here provided the skilled labour for Glasgow's renowned shipbuilding industry. By the late 70s, the industry declined. Before long, East End tenement slums were amongst the worst in Europe. The city's answer, whole-scale demolition. And tenants scattered. In 2005, another round of demolitions. This time, the high-rises that had replaced the tenements. Soon, the only people left in Dilmarnock were the ones who couldn't get out. Demolished and demoralised, for the community, the games had a chance to bring back some prosperity. With four years to go to the Games, there's a big event in Dilmarnock's hub, the Community Centre. Today, the Council is setting out its vision for the first time to the locals. Both George and Darren have come to hear the man with the plan, Councillor Archie Grail. I'm the uh, politician that's responsible for everything to do with the Games. Um, what that means really is that if the games go well, the Lord Provost and the Leader of the Council will take all the credit. <laughs> and if any difficulties, guess who's going to get the blame? Um, it's my responsibility from the Council's perspective to make sure the games are delivered on time, on budget, and leave a lasting legacy for the city of Glasgow. I'm up for that. I'll make sure that happens. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we need and the public to be behind what we're doing to support our efforts and to believe that they can benefit from the Games. Tagged onto the Games is around £2 billion to be spent here in the East End over the next 20 years. From housing to a new business park and train station, this is one of the UK's biggest regeneration projects. We will unashamedly use the Commonwealth Games to help us regenerate the east end of the city, which is long overdue. We are determined to try and get to as many Glaswegians as we possibly can to improve um, their uh, life expectancy, to improve their lifestyle, uh, and to, generally speaking, improve their standard of living on the back of the Games. As work progresses on the velodrome, the athletes' village is just getting started. But before you can build the future, you need to get rid of the past. Margaret Giaconelli has decided to refuse the council's order and stay put. You can see there's the... Well, she's living. You know, the tenement. Somebody said to me, do you not think she likes the attention? And I'm thinking, but... Why would you want the attention of living in a, a place where the the water system can't be the best? You know, you can't probably heat the, the, the property. You know, do people go and visit you there? Or, you know, can she bring her family in? No, I don't really know. George Evans no dead end for me. He's maybe doing it for the Commonwealth Village, but he's no dead end for me. It's very difficult to advocate and represent someone when you don't really know what they want. Does she want a house? Does she want money? Does she want both? I don't really know, know what she wants, but the compulsory purchase orders have been sent and I'm sure that'll concentrate minds and, and get a solution for Margaret. The compulsory purchase order of £30,000 is not enough to buy Margaret a similar two-bedroom flat here in the East End. I'm only a wee woman for the East End of Glasgow. I'm a Glaswegian and I've got rights like everybody else, but the way they're putting it through, it's like as if we are non-existent. I've just got to stand up and fight for, for everything. And I believe in the council is stealing my house off me. They're stealing it, and they're stealing my property, and I'm going to fight for it, because I'm not letting them away with it. Margaret's refusal to move has attracted interest from the West End. Dr Libby Porter, a tutor in regeneration at the University of Glasgow, has brought her students to Dumarnock for a field trip. Except first office or the problems with the neighbours? They, they all rented. They all rented from the Housing Association. So, of course, Margaret had bought her property and her family had bought her property through right to buy um, and, of course, then got stuck um, in a situation where everybody else got happily rehoused. She applied for a house around the corner um, and, and would have liked to have moved around there um, because all her friends had moved, you know, the people that lived around her, all her neighbours had moved, and they wouldn't let her have one because she wasn't a social tenant. She owned her property, so she wasn't eligible um, to be moved. We've got to ask questions about the roaming nature of these events and what effect they have on local populations. These kinds of events tend to get located, if you'd noticed, um, in the poorer ends of, of cities, the poorer sec sections of cities, because their land values are much lower, so it's much easier to get the land, uh, and you don't get much as much of a stink from the local population because they don't have as big a voice um, as the wealthier parts of cities. It's spring 2010, and at the other side of the city, the new Commonwealth Games logo is about to be unveiled. Our ambition is to create a long-lasting identity that will be associated with other world-class leading sports brands. Today, on Commonwealth Day, all eyes are on Councillor Archie Graham. 
absolutely, absolutely. It's another milestone uh, in, in the road to the games, and it's absolutely fabulous. The City Council hope the image of the games will help change Glasgow's reputation. There's been an unfortunate image attached to the city in times gone past. So we're trying to make sure it's the image of the modern Glasgow uh, that people uh, have rather than the one that existed 40 years ago. But in the East End, the stats haven't much improved. A 15-year-old boy has only a 50-50 chance of making it to the age of 65. Do you write that? What? Say no, say no to the games. Nah, I don't fuck off. I have to... boy Callum will be 15 by the time the games come to town. Are you coming? He's a very outdoors boy, isn't he? Oh, I have to be all the time. Mm -hmm. He's always it. He's interested in being a fireman and things like that. So, or a builder. Something that he needs to get really dirty at. <laughs> he likes getting dirty, so something like that. The last school in Dilmarnock closed in 2003, so the kids now have to be bused to the nearest primary and secondary schools. The odds are stacked against boys like Callum. Living here, he's three times more likely to leave school with no qualifications than the average British teenager. He's got a bad attention span. He found out he was dyslexic and six months ago, and they get a lot of help for it. So if he found out that, he calmed down a lot and things like that, and he's going a lot better at school. No, just one. Just hope he gets the support that secondary that he gets his primary. Two fives. Yeah. Two times five, Callum. Five and five. Yeah. Ten. I just hope he does good in the future. I know he will. As long as he's out the jail, they want him to end up in jail. Like a lot of other people and things like that want to make it good for his life. Meanwhile, Darren has received news about the compensation for his shops. Well, give me two seconds just to, to ask my wife if it's okay if I announce it right, because this is top secret information I'm going to tell you. Amanda, it's all right if, if I let Stephen Emma know. Your choice, we gonna see them. Right, okay. Right, let's go back out, because you're going to make a noise. <laughs> it worked to a uh, 65 grand a show to go. So uh, it's, it's no bad taking into consideration the size of the units. And what did you buy them for? We um, roughly about between 10 and 20 grand a show. But we spent a lot of money on them. With five children and another on its way, the compensation could set up Darren and his family for the future. The first thing we'll be doing is going on a holiday, clearing their feet, playing the balls, and then maybe come back and look at investment opportunities. <laughs> Engineering assistant Stephen is also making progress. Today he's come to show Callum School what he and his boss and mentor Manusis are up to. Introduce you to everyone first of all. We have Stephen, and Stephen, when he was your age, came to the Warnock Primary and he's now working in the area building all the new exciting buildings. My ambition is to become an engineer. I've always wanted to be an engineer since I've left school, but first I need to go to college and set my A levels and that so I can go to university. And if I play my cards right and hopefully gain enough from this job, and Mikel Payne will do that for me. Uh, well, good afternoon, boys and girls. Uh, <laughs> it's great to be here today. Um, we're your neighbours on the side. Um, you know, this is a great photograph of the area taken just about a week or two ago. Uh, does anyone see their, their home in this photograph? <coughs> Brilliant. I think... Munusis went to one of the best universities in Scotland. Really, he's just an inspiration to the, me for to become an engineer. Not much seems to be happening, but I promise you, from now on, you'll be seeing big changes. But to give you a better idea of what it's going to look like, I've got this image here. And it looks really good, doesn't it? I mean, this is going to be the developer here. 
and the arena next door. In a two years' time, you'll see that. It's a brand new building. Big arena in Glasgow will look ten times better. Amidst all the change in the East End, there is one thing that remains the same. Football. <laughs> Today it's the old firm, Rangers versus Celtic, with Celtic's football ground right on the borders of Dunmarnock. The supporters bring hard cash, good for Darren as his shop is soon to be shut down. The full fucking street boy oh, reunion gags. <laughs> and a chance for young Callum and his pals to make some pocket money looking after supporters' cars. You watch them and you run away. And then when you see them all up, then you run back up. I warned them not to take my sat and have up. So have you done well money wise today? Aye. What do you reckon you made? Come on, Steve. And sales of one of Glasgow's favourite drinks have soared. Look at my bucky. What's left? Export the tenants. Tell ain't left. I'd like to go home and watch a football game, but I obviously need to go out to cash and carry. Get more stuff in for them all coming out. <laughs> But for many fans, football goes hand in hand with religion. Glasgow's two main rivals are Celtic, historically a Catholic team, and Rangers, Protestant one. A history of sectarian tensions between the teams and their supporters goes back well over a hundred years. Youth workers in Delmarnock's community centre are now trying to play their part to stamp it out. So first week was what is sectarianism? We came up with different definitions and um, what that was. Some of us knew what it was but didn't know... In the last 10 years, over 2,200 people have been convicted of sectarian crimes in Scotland, including several murders. Do you think sectarianism is a problem in your life? Put your hand up. I'm going to show you, give you a perfect example. This is what I'm talking about. This is the boy Stuart Spencer dying. This is the uh, Camorio they've got for him. Come up here. What happened? Um, his life was taken from him. You mean he was uh, killed? Murdered, Murdered died. Why did you want to show me that? Just to show you what the sectarianism was like in Damarnock. Where sport has long divided the community, the council hope the games will bring it together. I am absolutely convinced um, that sport is probably one of the most powerful tools to bring about um, social change, bring about um, a better life uh, for people. And I'm absolutely determined to use the Commonwealth Games in 2014 to make sure that that's what happens in Glasgow. Summer 2010, and there is still no set date for the shops to be shut. In Darren's cafe, locals wonder about the council's priorities. Paying all the money for the railway station and everything else to be done up. But if they leave fishes like that for people coming from different countries to see, see that kind of uh, situation, it's ridiculous. Why not taking Durin Gyodin? Community new houses need to be spending all the money on all that. Come two weeks. That's the houses there that are staying. They're pre-war houses. They're about 80, 80 and 100 year old or something. And they're still getting left there. We want to know if they're coming down. We don't know nothing. Today, three quarters of the community live in social housing. 
After 2014 and a second phase of building work, over a thousand new houses will be up for sale. What we will have is we will have a very modern uh, estate, a mixture of houses for rent, houses uh, to buy, and indeed a care centre for elderly people uh, on that site after the games. A real integrated estate um, where, where, where people uh, will have a much improved standard uh, of living, many of them from the standard of living that they, they enjoy at the minute. It's a, it's a brilliant example of what, what we're trying to achieve in terms of legacy. A legacy they hope will benefit the monarch's youth. Today, 11-year-old Callum's leaving primary school for good. I'm just terrified I've got secondaries only. A wee boy, really. It's my baby, and <laughs> I'm losing him. That son, I've got secondary and all grown up now. It's terrifying for me and I mean Callum. <laughs> just seems so weak to go to secondary. That's my last baby away. <laughs> Sandra is raising Callum on her own. Dad on the oh no, no, not for Carl. It's been ten months. We don't want to see him. He takes, he takes drugs now, so it's not getting involved with my kids. And he doesn't really want to see his father anyway, so he's had the choice, but no chance. <laughs> Whoa! Dad thinks he can pop in and yearly basis, but that's not good for Carl. I mean, that's just come in one day, then get him things, then just walk away again. So that's not good. For Calum, I mean, that's not what he needs. <laughs> he doesn't need that. Do you know, do you want to see your daddy soon? Yeah. Aww. Hey. Yeah. In two thirds of households in Dilmarnock, children are brought up by a single parent. Darren is bucking the trend. My veins, I love them. I'd like to hopefully give my, give my veins a chance in life, Steve. It's not something you hear a lot in East End of Glasgow, because there's a lot of mas and dads. Maybe have not worked, or can he work? <laughs> After over 10 years of trading, Darren is forced to shut the last three remaining shops in Dilmarnock. Demolition is scheduled for a fortnight's time at the end of July. The demand was going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Anyway, ladies, to the end of an era. Hey. Tweet, tweet. <laughs> Sad. Terrible. Sad. The poor people are demanding if they suffer because of games. Exactly. Can you exactly. give me him? It was a good wee edit at one point, I know, so I just went to shut. Aye. Did you get that? <laughs> 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 Here you go, for the last time ever. God bless. The final chapter is now closed in the history of the manor, as far as the wee beautiful shops are concerned. 106 and 108 Springfield Road, the end of a great area in the history of the manor. Tweet, tweet. To be honest with you, I'm thinking I'm saying to myself, I'm not really giving a fuck the shops are shut. <laughs> To be honest, we am glad. <laughs> it's hopefully something good's gonna come out of it. Autumn 2010. After refusing to accept the compulsory purchase order of £30,000, Margaret is taken to court by Glasgow City Council. Three hours later, Margaret has lost. She decides to appeal her case. I've got to stand up and speak 
for my family and for my rights to be able to stay in my own home till they come in and start to negotiate. We've just got to keep fighting. At the end of the day, somebody will listen to us. And listen, they do. Soon the family become front page news. I'm in the house of Margaret Giaconelli. Now, tell us what's happening to you. If you don't pay for something, that's stealing. And this is what the council's doing. They're stealing my house. Despite the media interest, there's no thaw between Margaret and the city council. The council say they've tried to negotiate, but without any success. I'm on watch. I'm watching in case MD's coming round to evict me. I'm laughing now, but it's no funny. When you go to your home, you want to go out happy because you're moving to a new home. You don't want to go out sad that you're getting evicted for your home. It'll be the CJ Arden Lee Street because I ain't going anywhere. With Margaret and the Labour-led council in deadlock, MSP for Glasgow Bob Doris and Councillor McAllister, both from the Scottish National Party, get in on the act. The last thing I want to see is that, you know, as we prepare to get the handover from Delhi to Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games, is that we're talking about things like Mrs Jack and Ellie, but what we should be talking about is the great opportunity that the Commonwealth Games brings to our city. I think it's our job to, where appropriate, act as a middlemen to make sure we could not, not broker a deal, but just make sure that both sides are still talking and they don't both come entrenched in their views and ultimately make sure Mrs Jack and Ellie gets a fair price for, for her property. My father used to say he's never take the first offer, sir. Well, I'll leave that to you. He's a gambler. They're hoping to persuade the City Council to give Margaret a better deal. But on the very same day, Margaret receives a much better offer from the Council by post. Now, all of a sudden, they've upped heritage and they've, gave, they've offered me, I think it was 60,000 or 70,000 heritage. So. And what does heritage mean? Heritage is to do with how long you've been in a place. I think the home loss was only two and a half or something like that, and now they're up to eight. Well, and it's, it comes to about 80 something. Just need to wait and see what the lawyer says. Take it from there. Before she has the chance to speak to her lawyer, Councillor McAllister and his advisor turn up. You can't go back, man. Aye. That is the least you're going to get. Aye. And I think there's room for to, to improve that. Aye. So. That's what I was told this morning, there's room to improve on that, you know, so hopefully you'll get there and hopefully you'll get a, somewhere you love that you, you, you're happy with. I don't want a mortgage, that's the only thing. Aye, uh, there's definitely room for negotiation there. Mm. Aye. Uh, and with their advice, Margaret decides to refuse the offer. Meanwhile, the City Council's top brass have some business 4,000 miles away in Delhi. So this is the moment when Glasgow takes centre stage here in Delhi. And now, the flag is being handed over to Lord Provost of Glasgow, Councillor Mr Robert Winter. Glasgow's looking forward with great anticipation to 2014, when we will celebrate the great sporting occasion which is the Commonwealth Games. 300 volunteers from all over Scotland perform a lavish handover ceremony. Back in Dilmarnock, the man known locally as Gorgeous George, Councillor Redmond is doing his rounds. I remember as a, a young boy walking up and down this road, and it was really, really vibrant with people. You know, it was probably 10,000 people living in Dilmarnock at that, that time. Yes, it's, it's sad, but we're creating a new Dilmarnock, a new village, you know, where you actually have new shops and businesses, you know, real focal points for the community. Sure. 
Having won a landslide in the last two elections, George's constituents expect answers. They forget people stay in here. Billy, the built a Berlin Wall, the way you run the area. We can't get out, we can't get in. There's very few places in Scotland which we'll see the investment that's going in here. We've got, we've got to do what's best for the area, but Obviously. And we can't have I, I think some of the decisions are made that they're not hard enough about the people in the area. Some of that managing change. The managing change agenda. There's never been anywhere. I George, I don't know places. who managing change is. Well, that's what one thing about me. I, I'm not going to run away, I think, is that? Well, you can't hear on the way, because she's always doing the road to credit you, and your mud stays in Britain, your brother stays up there. Where can you run to? I uh, know, so... Because you've got to remember, if you want elected, you've got to show the people that you care for the area. Hey, more than shit, mud! With Darren forced to close his shops, the community centre tried to plug the gap by selling everyday basics. November 2010. Darren and his family have yet to receive their big payout for losing their businesses. Who'd a penny out from you? That's been 14 weeks, 15 weeks, maybe 16 weeks now. Exactly. Even worse, the shops are still standing empty. Months after they were meant to be demolished. So far, the shops have been shut for about four months and our community is just pissed off because it's made everybody's life ten times harder. We want to know what's happening when the, the work's starting, when the shops are getting built, when life can fucking start picking itself up a wee bit down here. Because what is at the present moment is fucking lorries, dirt, stool. And fucking walking for miles to get a loaf of bread. <laughs> it's about what we're living in. With a large family to support and no livelihood, finances are tight. Ten days to Christmas and Stephen is getting frustrated. They're still waiting on trying to get us into college, but they've not got the funding yet for like us to go. It does get quite annoying when you get told that you will be got to college and then you end up no. We need to wait and see what happens. Oh, this is Today is his first review. I've never had one of these before. I'm actually quite nervous about this. <coughs> oh. What would you say your ambitions, your career ambitions for you? I want to become an engineer, but if I'm like out there every day, then I'm not really learning any experience anymore. It's a case of turning up, doing the same job over and over again. We've well, experienced the same stuff. Like if we go into a survey, then two days later, we go out and do that uh, another survey. Every job is going to have repetitive mm -hmm. aspects, repetitive tasks. Aye. Um, so that is something that you, you need to, to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. um, as a company, so we can are very much wanting to invest in you and progress you. Aye. All right. No more. Okay. Well, keep up the good work. Aye. <laughs> and then it'll be hopefully another year. Aye, hopefully. Winter 2010 and the UK is hit with the big freeze. One of the coldest on record. In Glasgow, the council have upped Margaret's offer even further to £90,000. But her last ditch attempt in court to halt eviction has failed. 
he threw it out, he threw it out again. But I've given it Mike tomorrow at night. I've yeah. hardly slept. We hardly had a good sleep. Nanny's, my full family is the same. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen to us. You're thinking things. What, how did they know do this? How did they know do that? This hasn't been done right. And it's like as if you're trying to correct everything yourself. Uh, as if nobody's listened to you. Margaret and her husband Jack have been spending a fortune on heating, not helped by the empty flat surrounding them. That's frost, 14 degrees below. Windows have been took out above to froze it out. And if you see this picture here, that's, that's our home there. That's us heating the whole, we're heating this whole block. Normally I would have only been between 800 and 1,000 pound gas and electric a year. But because they took the windies for above me, I've been 5,000 pounds a year. The Jack and Ellie's have spent an extra 50,000 pounds on fuel bills since all their neighbours left over eight years ago. Armed with a new lawyer, Mike Daly, they launch a secondary action against the housing association who owned the flat above them. I can't think in you know, 20 years of my experience as a, uh, as a lawyer in Glasgow of somebody who, uh, because they were holding out in their house, uh, had uh, the property above them, had the, the windows removed and mesh put in so that the elements would go in, water would go in above your ceiling and your heating bills would, would go up uh, and rock it. Uh, and that's what happened, and we're looking at a, a claim against the housing association that was responsible for that. I've never seen that kind of intimidation. Out of legal options to fight the eviction, Jack, a roofer by trade, takes matters into his own hands. From there, steel bar across there, screw to the door, top, top, middle, that's that covered. Back door's basically the same. I can't go to work now. I've got to stay here and give her a hug because I can't leave her out of my head. I'm ready for a good fight. Don't worry about that. Nobody walks off Jack, Jack and Ellie. That's it. You need to bring the army in to get me out. No, the army, the SAS, because I'm not going anywhere. I've made up my mind. While the Jack and Ellie's don't want to leave Dalmarnock, Darren is keen to step out. His oldest daughter Cameron has taken piano lessons in Glasgow's affluent West End. Steve, look here, the big wobbly finished in Kent, meet us here. There's building work here too. Foundations for another Commonwealth Games venue, the Glasgow Hydro. Okay, about another a, a year, I think, Steve, and when it came back up and have a look at that, I think we'd see a major progress. Oh. She always wanted wee keyboards or something, and I say to her, man, there's no harm in trying it then, is it? What she's doing is just phenomenal. It's sometimes me and her mad, can't stop laughing at how successful and much progress that she's made for the time that she's worked with It's unbelievable, honest. She's doing a great job. Cameron's reached grade three in piano, but Darren won't let her forget where she came from. My wee granny taught me to be thankful and grateful for everything and anything you get. And that's the way it goes. And as I've seen, if any Marines were to try picture their sale or compare their sale to people, well, I don't know any more of that. It wouldn't they fucking kick their way up the arse if they tried to do that to anybody. Because I would certainly do it. Simple as that. <laughs> It's March 2011. Welcome to see Jack. 
After eight years of living in a condemned street, the Jack and Ellie family prepared to face down eviction. Four sleepers. Steel rod, so they can't change so. So good luck to them. Bastards. Scholar turned activist. Dr Libby Porter from University of Glasgow is on hand to lend support. They barricaded themselves in and the sheriff's officer's eviction notice, as far as I'm aware, was good from Friday noon. And what we anticipate will happen is that sheriff's officers will, will remove them. The outcome of, of eviction is not something anybody wants. Really what we needed was a bit of movement from, from Margaret. The games, given obviously the importance of it to, to Dunmanock, to Glasgow, to Scotland, um, will not be, there's not one person who will, will stop that. Uh, Athletes Valley has been built. As day three of the barricade comes to an end, friends and family sneak out for a carry out. Mm -hmm. Day six, still no eviction. Hopefully, um, Auntie Margaret and your grand and everybody will get out, would they? Margaret's lawyer plans to scale up the fight, but getting in to see his client isn't that simple. Margaret Giaconelli's lawyer was forced to climb through the window of her home to discuss the move after she barricaded herself in. The council who want to demolish the flat ahead of the Commonwealth Games. So we've got the application then. I've drafted this application to the European Court of Human Rights. I think we've got a, we've got a pretty decent case to be honest. So, oh, right. I've got the envelope ready to go to Strasbourg, European Court of Human Rights. Now obviously as I've explained, I know how long it could take. It could take a long time, right? But the point is, if you're successful, it's a really powerful remedy. Mike wants to take Margaret's case to the European courts and fight for a universal principle. Um, the compulsory purchase order process in Scotland is not fair to ordinary working people because you don't have the money to pay for a legal team, to pay for evidence, to pay for expert witnesses. And if you're on a low income, there's no legal aid available. So there's one there, maybe that pen. The council have access to QCs, they have access to uh, expert witnesses, so they can present this case in a very compelling way. So in terms of the equality of arms between the parties, it's really a case of David versus Goliath, but in this case, uh, David doesn't even, even have a slingshot. Now, what's the best way to, to, to get out? Minutes. Okay. 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 As night falls, all but a few press have left, with many supporters having to resume their own lives. Margaret and her close family can only wait. I feel like a caged animal now. I'm in this house, I can't even open a window in case there's a sheriff officer out there. And a hunt coming in the window to grab you. We're waiting in the name to make the move. We can't do nothing. We've, we're, we've done we're, this. We're, we've done this. Our move has been made. The fort's been built. We're waiting for the Indians to come and take the fort half as simple as that. Isn't it? Day seven. Two hours to sunrise. Jack has rigged a CCTV camera to give them an early warning. Christ will make this out. That's a, a lot of coat. Yeah. 
allowing this and this day and age to show assholes to run about in shorts for two weeks. Then displays a whole lot of people like still man up. And then say they're going to leave as a legacy. Look what a fucking legacy. Black and blue marks for these sheriff officers. Ah, oh, see here, look. Next time on Commonwealth City. <laughs> Margaret and Jack's family home is torn down with no compensation in sight from the council. Six weeks down the line, I've not had a penny or any correspondence for them. Darren uses the compensation money to give his kids the life he never had. I'm sure it's every man dies dream getting their veins sent to a private school. And when all seems lost, Domaric calls on one of its own to save the day. For us, the only way is up. And to get as much out of this as we can for this community.